P.T. Barnum is someone who we've all heard of, I'm guessing, even though the saying that we all think is attributed to him is entirely apocryphal, but we'll get to that later. P.T. Barnum was born Phineas Taylor Barnum. You might be able to see why he just decided to go by the two letters of his name. On July 5th, 1810, in Bethel, Connecticut. And I have to say, we are not here, to all of your disappointment perhaps, for the, great show, for the greatest show on earth. We're here for parts of it, but not for the circus. Not for Jumbo, who, speaking of language, thank you, Brianne, our origin of why we call things Jumbo is because of Jumbo the elephant. It doesn't particularly have any huge mention in usage until Jumbo the elephant. Not the only mark on language left by Barnum. Not for Tom Thumb, who was there at his wedding. OK, Cupid was really weird back then. <laughs> we are here not for his hoaxes, even. No, no. He was a humbugger, which, yes, in fact, actually means hoax. But when you read him describing his own hoaxes, he put them forth as humbugs not as hoaxes. He did later on in his biography, but in the time and in the press of the day, they were referred to as humbugs. And depending on how you want to see the language, to be honest, he went through pretty much all of them except for the kind of sweet meat, and he probably did that too. Just, I, I, I don't know. There's no historical record for that one. The records are kind of shady for the sweet meats. They don't, they don't, they don't go to special collections really well. And he was known for his humbugs, being a man of his humbugs. And the many that they were, he was even portrayed as being a humbug. But you have to start off as a humbug somewhere. And if it's the 1840s, why not start off with Joyce Heth, who was said to be the 160 some odd year old nanny of George Washington. She was paralyzed, nearly blind, and died after seven months of extensive touring. People incessantly touched her hands, which they thought were the hands that touched George Washington as a boy. There's its own amount of creepiness about that. Let's not go there. We'll just leave that one for, for the armchair philosophers. She sang a variety of hymns and was very garrulous when speaking of her protege, Dear Little George as she termed the great father of our country. Barnum bought Joyce, who was a slave, from Mr. R.W. Lindsay. Lindsay had asked for $3,000. Barnum talked him down to 1000 Barnum, of course, seized on this, published books called Heth, a minor showman, published books with lovely things like this. At the age of 15, she was cruelly torn from the bosom of her parents and her native land by one of those inhuman beings who in those days, to enrich themselves, made merchandise of human flesh. I guess it's okay if you got a $2,000 discount. By the way, Barnum later on ends up being quite the abolitionist. He never mentions anything about Heath in his papers or letters later on, but maybe I'd like to think maybe something kicked around. Joyce Heth. So then it was, she's not 161 years old. That's impossible. She's not Methuselah. Joyce Heth is not a human being. What purports to be a remarkably old woman is simply a curiously constructed automaton made up of whale bone, <laughs> India rubber, and numbers of springs ingeniously put together and made to move at the slightest touch according to the will of the operator. So Joyce Heth went from being a slave to being a slave who made her, who was being, who was fetching a high price, who was being traded as someone who was George Washington's nanny, who was 161 years old, to being a machine in the span of a few months. He still never makes any specific purchase of Heath from his owner, from her owner. He flat out calls them hoaxes though. He goes back and forth between hum humbug and hoax. And he autopsies Joyce Heth in a tavern for 50 cents a head. 
so that everyone could see if she in fact had a desiccated heart and an atrophied body. All the doctors said she wasn't more than 80 years old. That leads us to the next humbug, because once one scam is over and dead, literally, you have to move on to the next. It's the showman. The Fiji mermaid. He promoted it with images like this, sold it as a great curiosity, and of course sold it with cleavage and bare breasts, because, well, do I actually need to explain that, really? <laughs> the thing was, that is not what the Fiji mermaid looked like. Looked like. Of one illusion, the sight of wonder has forever robbed us. We shall never again discourse, even in poesy, of mermaid beauty, nor, moo, nor woo a mermaid, even in our dreams. For the Fiji lady is the very incarnation of ugliness. <laughs> there was a little bit of buyer's remorse for someone who paid 25 cents for this, one of whom was a senator from Missouri, who the show had been languishing in Washington, D.C., and he went and saw the show and had the, show, had the barker at the show arrested for fraud because it was not, in fact, a mermaid. This then hit all the papers, and Barnum's show was then, in fact, a nationwide hit. <laughs> all publicity is good publicity, right? That's the world we live in, isn't it? The Fiji mermaid was brought to the American Museum in 1842 at a most extraordinary expense. Barnum loved to say the extraordinary expenses and difficulties that he went to getting his hoaxes. And when he would be corrected in his own personal correspondence that it only cost such and such or so and so, the comment would be, why should we bother contradicting them? It sounds good. It was presented by Dr. J. Griffin, a member of the British Lyceum of Natural History, bearing a remarkable curiosity, a real mermaid caught near the Fiji Islands in the South Pacific. The thing though was, he actually was Levi Lyman who had assisted him with Joyce Heff. It was the same roving pack of characters over and over again. The mermaid spent the rest of its days being moved from museum to museum, much like the rented mermaid, because in fact Barnum rented the Fiji mermaid back and forth from museum to museum in Chicago and Boston and Pittsburgh until one of Barnum's many unfortunate fires. The Peabody Museum at Harvard has this Fiji mermaid, which they say possibly, maybe, was rescued in the fire, or it's about contemporaneous. We don't really know. It's kind of not a real thing anyway. Why are you asking us so much questions about a fake thing? <laughs> We're a real museum. We're Harvard. Bugger off, kid. I mean, that's not what the card record says, but it's kind of what they're getting at. <laughs> now we get to go to Cooperstown, New York, home of the Baseball Hall of Fame, home of the Farmer's Museum, and the final resting place of the Cardiff Giant, who was found in the 1860s digging for a well, which just happened to be where the owner of the land told them to dig that well. And a foot down, they happened to find a big ossified man. <laughs> nobody, nobody questioned this. You, know, you see what you want to see. The giant wasn't an invention of Barnum. But of tobacconist named George Hull, who was an atheist, it stemmed from an argument at a Methodist revival about a poorly translated part of Genesis, which if, if it's kind of a shoddy version of the Bible, it's the giants walked among us. Well, so what he did was he went and went to a gypsum quarry, got a large p pile of stone, had it moved there by train, and had them dig the wells exactly on that spot of where they had chipped out, carved out, and aged this fake man. The, uh, there were some problems though you know, it didn't really seem real. Funny problem. <laughs> then we enter Barnum. There's a sucker born every minute. But actually, that wasn't him. That was most likely one of the original Cardiff Giants hoaxmen saying that P.T. Barnum had a copy of the Cardiff Giant 
and that in fact it was a fake of the fake. But they hadn't admitted it was a fake yet. And as Tom Waits said, sucker born every minute, you just happen to come along at the right time. <laughs> Mark Twain parodied it in the territorial enterprise. Giants became all the rage as far as humbugs went in the 1860s. A judge said in one of the suits against Barnum, bring your giant here and if he swears on his, as to his own genuineness on a bona fide petrifaction, you shall have the injunction which you ask for. <laughs> I don't think he could raise his right hand and put it on the Bible. I think that was the technical problem. On November 25th, Yale paleontologist Nathaniel Marsh, it is a very recent origin and a most decided humbug. I am surprised that any scientific observers should not have at once detected the unmistakable evidence against its antiquity. On December 10th, Hull confessed all in the press. And of course, then the Cardiff giant becomes one of the greatest deceptions which is marked by another one of those signs that you stare at on the side of the road <laughs> while you tell your kids to not get mustard on their damn shirts again. <laughs> P.T. Barnum died April 7th, 1891 in Bridgeport, Connecticut. He was proud of his humbugs and his hoaxes. He was revelatory of them. He regaled in them. He revised his autobiography 40 times in as many years. And somehow, Jumbo ended up becoming the mascot of a university. And universities, he pitted universities and museums against each other because he was a real scientific museum man. Science! Science. So, let's raise a glass to the man who taught us, who taught us, the, who taught us that the American public would buy anything.